By first uh, briefly summarizing again uh, your article and then commenting about some assumptions um, and then we will um, yeah, link your article uh, into the literature about food self-sufficiency and food sovereignty. Um, so, yeah, first, you, um, in your paper, you analyze um, possibilities for food self-sufficiency in the island of La Réunion by taking an approach where you account for all the material fluxes that are associated with um, food supply, agriculture, and li um, livestock farming, and for reasons that you explained, you all convert them into a common yeah, accounting matrix, which is nitrogen. And then you use this approach to first look at the current state of the agricultural food system in La Réunion, and you find um, a huge imbalance between the imports and exports, and um, in general, a huge dependency uh, on import of nitrogen in form of um, feed for livestock farming um, in form of synthetic fertilizers and yeah, food import. And then in the next step, by taking some assumptions, um, you develop scenarios um, where La Réunion is becoming more food self-sufficient, um, so it need, uh, meets its citizens' need for um, food by own domestic production and you have like a specific um, interpretation of that which is that no um, yeah, uh, feed for, for livestock or synthetic fertilization um, fertilizers are imported. And then um, the scenarios vary in the share of animal-based food in the total consumption of, of proteins and so do the imports and exports of animal-based foods and yeah those scenarios um, show that La Réunion can be self-sufficient if uh, three requirements are meet or met um, this is first uh, the implementation of an agroecological food crop rotation system second limiting the livestock to only locally available uh, food resources or feed resources and an adjustment into human diet. And yeah, so <coughs> you said in your paper that um, yeah, your scenarios have to be tested um, according to the sensitivity to assumptions and you name some assumptions like the population size explicitly but some assumptions we want to highlight that are more <laughs> made implicitly. So first um, you build your scenarios on uh, um, fertilization yield a relationship that is calibrated um, to the or with data from the current agricultural food system, and um, yeah, there's a there, there's a body in the literature that analyzes the impact of climate change on on yield, and we were wondering if uh, yeah the 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 fertilization uh, yield function that you assume holds also in case of of um, yeah rising temperatures. Which brings me to the second point, that um, you um, take sort of like normal years or like an average um, of, of, of uh, like a normal situation, and of course there is variability between the years and, and in terms of yield, and this becomes again more important with uh, climate change and extreme weather events, and we wonder to what extent self uh, food self sufficiency can also be feasible in, in times of yeah, variation or variability. And uh, thirdly, um, you take sort of annual um, material fluxes and we were wondering if seasonality plays a role if uh, food self-sufficiency can be sustained during the entire year. Um, so to start framing our discussions and I, I'm going uh, here briefly because uh, most of these things were already mentioned by the professor or by my colleague. Uh, just to highlight that it's a very densely populated uh, a scenario and I, personally I, I like to see uh, La Réunion in the map to see that it's very far from France and it's in the middle of the Indian Ocean but it's also far from the traditional uh, trade routes and this has effects on, on their situation. 
their rice is uh, their diet is based in rice and uh, meat consumption is increasing as already was highlighted by the professor uh, their main product exports are sugar run and pineapple and as was mentioned before by the professor and by Maddie Noel, there is a, a very uh, a big problem of imports dependency, but also problems like real estate speculation that is also a problem uh, for agricultural land use. And we will also like to highlight that, uh, as, as the professor explained before, that there is already uh, the community is organized and is asking for a hundred percent of organic food and uh, food and local food uh, in 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 the in the island. So, yes, it's fine. And also, uh, as to frame this discussion, and as it is an economics class. Uh, the first questions that uh, in in this class we used to have is like the effects of food self-sufficiency in the trade and the local economy. As you can see in the first graph, uh, the main this this uh, this graph is about the employment in La Reunion. As you can see in yellow, the public administration is the main source of employment with 43 percent of the employee employees, and here. We have in yellow agriculture sector with only accounts for 1% of the employment in the island. As mentioned before, uh, there is a problem because the island relies a lot on food imports, but also regarding to exports. Uh, the export sector represents only 4.2% uh, of the total GDP of the island, which is very low. And this is a problem already analyzed and taken into account by the public authorities of La Reunion. They, they attach this problem uh, to, to the geographical location of, of the island. And also, we would like to discuss the risk of self-sufficiency uh, with a very interesting paper uh, wrote by Jennifer Clapp in 2017. Uh, she highlights three main risks of food self-sufficiency. Uh, the first one is production variability that can lead uh, to disruptive fluctuations in domestic supplies. Uh, she mentions that natural disasters uh, can lead to shortfalls in production and in consequence, episodes of hunger that, and she mentioned also that openness to trade uh, creates opportunities to import in periods of shortage and to export in times of abundance. The second risk uh, that she mentions is that market intervention is designed to ins insulate economic domestic markets, uh, can result in lower production and higher food prices, thereby harming long-term food security. Uh, this is a statement that is also supported by institutions such as the World Bank uh, that criticize that trade distorbi distorting public policies because they make agriculture less resilient uh, to exogenous shocks, for example. The third one is that food self-sufficiency policies that um, can harm incentives for farmers producing export for export, which denies uh, the producer the incomes that would come uh, uh, from from the exports. Uh, and the last one, and I think is very very inter interesting, uh, this critique that the environmental constraints to food security. Uh, as noted above, uh, some studies has stressed that not all countries have natural resource space that will allow them uh, to supply all their food needs domestically. Uh, the environmental constraints faced by food importing countries were stressed also by the WTO and they categorized uh, this uh, production and export uh, of food as an environmental obligation. However, uh, the risk highlighted by Jennifer Clapp are based in the assumption that for uh, food self-sufficiency, you have to close your borders. And it is not like that, you have options. Uh, she mentioned that usually the countries are like in two extremes of the public policy, 
One is like rely totally on imports for your food su uh, su supply. And the other one is, is, is close the borders completely and rely on, on domestic uh, production. But she also mentions that in order to have food self-sufficiency, uh, what you want is to guarantee the food for your local population. And it doesn't mean that you have to close the borders to imports in the hard times or to exports when you have more sources. Uh, so it's, it's interesting to advance to a more uh, broad uh, public policy that consider the mix of the public choices. So my, my colleague, Marie Noel, will talk about more about food security. Um, food serenity, um, and that concept that you, you, like in your introduction, you do not only define food self-sufficiency, but also food serenity by highlighting that this is a concept that emphasizes democratic control over the, the food supply. And then you do not really engage more with this, <laughs> with this concept. Um, and we were wondering why you mentioned the concept. Maybe this is because the literature is yeah, interlinked uh, somehow, and it's like discussed uh, jointly under the umbrella of, of food um, security, but also maybe because you would agree with um, uh, the call that is often made from the movement of food serenity for um, ecological methods um, to, yeah, to reach food self-sufficiency. And then, uh, yeah, lastly, when one would think about how to organize or to yeah, transform the system, um, reaching food self-sufficiency, this implies um, yeah, fundamental changes and it yeah, might be obvious to ask for like a um, democratic organization of this transformation. So yeah, we looked at um, the literature of food sovereignty to find some more arguments um, that are useful to discuss your, your scenarios. And um, in general, the yeah, there are many. Uh, well it's important to highlight that there are many uh, definitions of food serenity and different concepts. It's a, a movement, it's a campaign, but it's also a research um, concept and frame. And the the research um, the in social science um, regarding food serenity spans a bunch of, of problems, to name only a few. It's about f food politics, agroecology, land reforms, um, ecological sustainability. And um, it's a field <laughs> where various academic disciplines engage. And um, yeah, we just want to highlight few of the challenges that are discussed in, in this body of literature. I don't know if I have time for all of them. <laughs> but um, so one challenge that is often addressed is that uh, in the concept of food serenity um, and also food self-sufficiency um, yeah, emphasizes the local level, but uh, there is a, it's not so easy to define like what is a local food system. Um, it not only implies geographical um, aspects, but also social aspects. And um, yeah, that brings me to the second point that um, more than the majority of the popul world population lives in, in urban areas and the trend is positive while uh, this people or people in urban areas um, consume an even higher share of the total produced uh, food globally um, and so yeah the research really is much about how to make constant about like between different groups so it implies dynamics between farming and non-farming, rural social groups, producers and consumers, rural and urban areas, north and south, gender roles. And um, yeah, <laughs> the literature states that there might be a, a tension between the freedom of choice, what to produce, to what extent, and yeah, uh, the concept of food self sufficiency, which requires a certain kind of yeah, crop rotation, certain kind of crops. So there's the tension. I don't have <laughs> time for the, for the next point. So we would like to yeah, open the discussion and ask you, yeah, what kind of, um, yeah, what, what is needed to, to make your scenarios more <laughs> feasible? <laughs> like not from a geo biochemical point of view, but more from a yeah, social point of view. Also, the discussion you got um, regarding yeah. the interest, economic interest in, okay. in, the, in the reunion, and also the possible policy scenarios that you see around the, the literature that were discussed also. Yeah. Thank you.
you. Thank you. Yeah. I think you can <laughs> discuss to them, I guess. You, yeah, usually you come up again and then people <laughs> ask questions. <laughs> Thank you for your excellent discussion of uh, that, that you just presented. Uh, I, I like the fact that you read carefully the the paper by Clapp, uh, which is excellent and very balanced, much more balanced than I am. <laughs> In fact, uh, well, uh, I have to justify a little bit my my standpoint. In fact, uh, first, I am a biogeochemist, and so. Uh, when I began to, to work on this issue, in fact, it, it, I was asked by an organization, Oasis Réunion, that you mentioned. I was asked by them. I, I didn't know anything about Réunion Island, in fact, at that time. <laughs> it, it was uh, four years ago. Uh, uh, I was contacted by them and they asked, because they had read the, the work I, I made for Europe, and they asked me, can you make, can you help us to demonstrate that, or not, huh, that food self-sufficiency is possible for Réunion Island? Okay, so I was not engaged in a political uh, action in Réunion. I don't live there, I didn't know a lot of, of that, but I was asked this question, and so, okay, uh, I found that interesting, and my, well, I tried to answer this question as a biochemist: Is this feasible, biochem, enfin, biochemically <laughs> speaking, uh, or not? Uh, are there biophysical obstacles uh, that make that dreaming of food self-sufficiency is just a dream. <laughs> uh, and so I made calculations and I demonstrated that, okay, um, it's possible, but it implies uh, large structural changes. And that was my answer. So I don't say, I don't think I, I said here, <laughs> neither, that uh, it is desirable. That's not my problem, in fact, that's not my question. I, I'm not legitimate to, to say, yes, okay, it's, uh, it would be fine. For, for Europe, I, I have a, a much <laughs> strong opinion about that. Uh, I think that the, the territorial specialization of the region in Europe is, is completely unsustainable. So, so for, for that, I am sure and I can argue for that. For Réunion Island, uh, full self, uh, food, sorry, full food self-sufficiency uh, is probably not a good thing for, for the reason that you mentioned, uh, the, this region of variability. You are completely right that I made all my calculations averages and that there is strong variability, maybe increasing variability because we, we know that with uh, climate change the frequency of uh, extreme events of uh, typhoon and, and cyclones uh, can uh, increase a lot and that's true that uh, in case of such an extreme event uh, that uh, the problem of food supply in case of a complete closing of uh, the market in the island would be a problem. So uh, probably th there is there a conflict between food security and uh, food self-sufficiency and probably some equilibrium should be found, found between uh, produ domestic production and satisfaction of the needs of the, the, the island by domestic production uh, and the possibility of importing, exchanging with uh, the rest of the world, in particular in case of uh, 
uh, of needs of disruption of the internal markets so and, and this is only possible if the trade infrastructure are maintained if you have harbored uh, regular ships uh, and regular shipping and things like that so probably this equilibrium has to be found for this kind of isolated island and so i i am not sure i would uh, I, I would defend the idea of a full self-sufficiency for the island. Just, it is possible uh, as an average. Uh, well, th that's all I said, in fact. <laughs> uh, did I answer your question by that? Oh, yes. The, the risk inherent to the, the lack of uh, Competitivity of farmers in case of uh, uh, of closed market. I don't believe in that at all. Uh, <laughs> I think that these are arguments uh, of those economists preaching for for opening an extension of international um, uh, market, and I, I don't see any reason for 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 that. In fact, uh, there, there are lots of other intensive. Than, than those uh, provided by opening the market internationally. I, I, I don't see that a serious argument. But for the rest, you were right. <laughs> Thank you very much for the presentation, for the discussion with students. And now we can open the floor. Thanks also, both of you, or the three of you, for respecting the time, allowing us to have 50 minutes more or less for, for further discussions. So let's collect the questions. And meanwhile, I'd like to have back the list of presents, if I don't know who has it, but then we can start collecting the questions. Okay. So please, uh, your names and countries of origin. Thank you. Um, I'm Charlie from the United Kingdom. Um, in, in your view, if uh, say reunion had change would change to the more sustainable diet what what we see as a consequence of modern diets is that for example height and many other aspects of health uh, have really changed compared to how they were two three hundred years ago. How would this move to a sustainable diet affect that? Would it potentially even improve it further if it becomes more healthy or have the reverse effect what's your take? Hi, I'm Reshma. I'm from Bangladesh. So my question is, uh, like, <coughs> how does the reliance on sugarcane monoculture uh, impact Reunion Island's uh, agriculture diversification uh, and food self-sufficiency goals? Yeah. How, how does the reliance on sugarcane monoculture impact Reunion Island's agriculture uh, agricultural diversification and food self-sufficiency goals. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I'm Zulfia from Azerbaijan. Uh, my question is about uh, opening agri-food system and self-sufficiency uh, because for me, uh, it's very hard to comprehend, but I would like to hear your perspective because uh, we don't uh, anymore. We don't live in a pre-industrialized period where there are much less people, and there are like people already living in places where it's impossible even do agriculture. For example like Saudi Arabia or others like similar countries or like small island countries which is very vulnerable to exposure of climate change change and like many other countries and for Azerbaijan for example like I can give the uh, example about uh, con like a wheat uh, agri food uh, like uh, agriculture part which is strategically very important and government invests like heavily for having like own um, production of uh, wheat because it's for food security matters but on the other hand it drains a lot of um, like it like significantly affects to the uh, like soil because uh, we are in subtropic slash dry climate and for wheat we need like there is a need for like a lot of water and like it, it like uh, destroys the land on the other hand it 
it's not very um, like efficient, like they could buy easily and maybe like um, do, for example, let's say strawberries and sell strawberries, which is more expensive than wheat and maybe buy um, like a wheat. But because of this uh, like food security matters, they invest a lot, which is like spending a lot from the like economic perspective. But on the other hand, it's like destroys the soil as well. So it's very debatable, like how to solve this problem, like on one hand, having a lot of intensive um, systems where it's like creating also other problems as you mentioned and it's very relevant but on the other hand there are countries that literally cannot go back as easily as it was before anymore so like my question is how to balance this and how to manage to like at least provide some part of so, like self-sufficiency but on the other hand to make sure that there is not that much damage as like yeah so that's my question i hope it's clear <laughs> Duran, these three questions are very different from each other. So um, I, I try to, to first answer to the question of diet. Um, well, <laughs> we, we could have made a, a full conference about the uniformization of diet over the world. Huh? Uh, the, um, the differences between countries are reducing in terms of, of at least, it, well, no, how to say that. Traditional diets disappeared everywhere. Uh, and and that's, that's a terrible thing. Uh, because uh, it, it's also uh, the incentive for imports of a lot of, of things. So the the fact that uh, the traditional uh, the, the hamburger is becoming the shared <laughs> uh, dish of over the world with fries and uh, a hamburger uh, a piece of mashed uh, beef between two breads uh, that's terrible that, that's a terrible thing because uh, uh, that's bad, <laughs> from my point of view. Uh, that's uh, not healthy, uh, and that's extremely demanding in terms of resources, and that's not pro that's not suitable to production everywhere. Wheat is cannot be grown everywhere. A beef cannot be uh, uh, be produced everywhere, and uh, potatoes neither. So, okay, uh, I, I think that really. The question of diet is central to all these things. It's central in terms of shaping uh, the trade uh, networks over the world. And from that point of view, coming back to something which, um, to, to a, a diet which is more appropriate to each country, to the resources to the diversity of resources that can be cultivated uh, in, in each country. Uh, so, in, in some way, preserving the cooking traditions of each country, country is very important. But that's completely in opposition to the trade of globalization, to, to the trends of globalization everywhere. And, uh, okay, so, so uh, I think there, there, there is uh, an urgent need to questioning this uniformization of diet in uh, a, a, at least as an objective of what is called development. Okay, so that, that would be my answer. And um, clearly it's not a question of coming back to the diet of uh, one century ago. It's coming back, because that can evolve, but it's coming back to some kind of uh, adequation between what we eat and what we can cultivate, if you see what I mean. And, and that's important, more than anything else. On the other hand, uh, diet is also the cause of uh, 
very acute problems, health problem. Uh, obesity, obesity is a question, uh, it's not a question of rich countries whose people are eating too much. It's a question of semi-poor countries uh, where people are eating bad. And that's not the same. Huh? And, and eating bad, that's very often eating this kind of standardized international food. Did I answer your question? Uh, but maybe not on entirely. Yeah, so <laughs> you would expect, say, life expectancy to improve with if we had more, like, more of a sustainable diet. Mm -hmm. what, what we would... Imp what, sorry? Like life expectancy. Ah, life expectancy. Or like height. Uh, how would you expect these things to change if we adopt a more sustainable diet? Uh, well, that's that's not my specialty to say that. I'm, but uh, what I what I am sure of is that uh, uh, the diet is a very <coughs> important factors of environmental health, <laughs> uh, besides human health. Uh, I, I'm not a medical doctor, so I cannot say you anything about. But uh, well. Uh, what I heard is that, in fact, it's a very important factor of uh, of human health too. Today, about uh, well, about sugarcane. Sugarcane uh, monoculture of sugarcane, in fact, uh, was not the rule. I, I could not say that it was the rule in uh, Reunion Island because you, you know the, the, the very ancient history of Reunion Island is that it was an uninhabited uh, island when it was discovered and annexed by France. Uh, there were no nobody there, so it was uh, colonized just for f first for producing uh, staple food for the ships. Uh, so anything where it was cultivated there, wheat, rice, uh, potatoes, everything was cultivated there. F first thing, first thing. Second phase, um, and cultivated by colons, that pe people put there uh, to just to to, to grow uh, <laughs> vegetables. Uh, second phase. Uh, beginning of plantations and this was coffee at that time that was uh, the seventh 17th century coffee was grown there with slaves imported so the population is entirely imported from Af africa madagascar at, at that stage uh, then uh, coffee was replaced gradually by sugar cane that was the the end of the 18th century beginning of the 19th century with more and more slaves more and more plantation and, and that's the beginning of the complete invasion of sugar cane everywhere uh, that's period with people imported not only from africa but also from india uh, and uh, okay that was the 19th century and when uh, at the end of uh, yes, in the middle of the 20th century, when uh, after World War II, where when um, Reunion Island was uh, was uh, departmentalized, that means became a French department. Uh, in fact, the interest of the great owners of the uh, sugar plants. Uh, where, if, okay, they, they were they, they were the, the master of the island. Uh, th that was the, the bourgeoisie at that time was uh, mostly uh, dominated by the sugar uh, plant owners. Uh, although th it was this was a minority of the population, but they they were very influenced, and so uh, they obtained that the s French state continued to uh, guarantee them markets for their sugar. And so the, this question of the monoculture of cane was not uh, questioned at that time. And has never been questioned, in fact, until, until very recently. Uh, wha what happens is that the slaves were freed. Uh, their 
mostly became small planters that you mentioned. Uh, and there is a huge, enfin, the agricultural population, which is a very small part of the population, but the agricultural population is mainly made of uh, small planters, depending on these uh, two <laughs> plants for, tran for transformation of their production. Uh, okay, that's not very sustainable. Economically, it's a catastrophe, as I said. Uh, but okay, that, that's how it is. And it's, it's the legacy of this colonial history. And it's very difficult to, to change that, uh, sociologically speaking. Uh, now, um, ecologically, uh, this monoculture of cane cultivation is a catastrophe, of course. It requires, as any monoculture, it requires lots of fertilizers, synthetic fertilizer, only fertili uh, synthetic, and lots of uh, pesticides to, to maintain this monoculture uh, alive. So, well, it's not good at all for uh, the ecology of these soils. Uh, okay, it's not as bad as, as the monoculture of bananas that you have in other islands uh, in, the, in the Antilles, for instance, but uh, sugarcane is not good for soils, at least in, uh, in uh, monoculture. It's a, culture, it's a crop that resists pretty well to hurricanes. And that's also a reason why, uh, well, that's an argument for maintaining sugarcane, because sugarcane is not completely destroyed when you have a very exceptional uh, typhoon. That's a, also a, an argument that you s often hear. Uh, from, from that respect, it's true that it's more resilient than some other uh, crops. Okay. Did I answer? Uh, your question was about, uh, ah yes, about, in fact, uh, about the feasibility of self-sufficiency at the world scale, uh, the global scale. Uh, well, uh, I didn't mention that at all, but that's of course a question we, we, we are conscious of. And we try to use uh, to, to construct those scenarios I showed you for Europe and for Réunion, but for Europe I showed you those scenarios based on these three levers. Uh, can we apply that at the world, at the global scale? Dividing the world into, I'll say, about 12 big regions. Europe is one, North America is another one. Uh, the Southeast America is Brazil, Argentina is one region the eastern part of the the western part of south america is another one distinct from from the for the the, uh, the former um, china uh, india former soviet union okay or uh, maghreb and uh, um, and uh, east uh, come on proche orient or do you say that uh, Middle East, thank you. <laughs> Maghreb and Middle East is also one region with those very specific characteristics that you mentioned. Those, those regions cannot, can, can simply not produce enough food for their, their very large population, so they have to import. They can export energy, but they have to import. Okay, so uh, taking into account all these specificities of the different parts of the world, we try to apply these, uh, these levers to, well, to reach as much self-sufficiency by regions as possible. And or the, the reason there was, the, the, the conclusion there was uh, no, self-sufficiency for each of these 12 regions of the world is not possible. So some uh, international food trade has to be maintained, particularly for those regions like uh, Maghreb and uh, Middle East. Uh, India, not, not sure, and uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. These are the three regions which cannot, which biophysically cannot reach food self-sufficiency. So even taking my arguments, uh, some international trade is necessary and will still be necessary. But 
uh, when you see the, the, uh, the, the, the curve of increasing the level of international trade of food stuffs, uh, this trajectory cannot be continued. So it has to be reduced in some way. Okay, it cannot be completely suppressed. <coughs> With a demographic projection, we, we can have for 2050. So, okay, you are reason. You you you, you are right. Uh, it I this is not applicable at the global scale. But we can go much closer to self-sufficiency that we are tending today. Okay. <coughs> Hi, thank you for the presentation. I'm Isabella for Braz uh, from Brazil. And I was wondering, uh, like, the distinction between the calorie or nitrogen or some other alternative uh, to measure. Because uh, you pointed that nitrogen uh, is good because, like, it's uh, more or less the same need for everyone. But then I was wondering, like, for famine reasons, I think maybe caloric could be like because caloric deficit, I think it's more common than protein deficit. And yeah, I was a bit trying to understand also like the index, uh, the import index that you used. Uh, it's like the the needs of food are measured based on like current diet, and then like in the world then the current diet of like the United States would be super high and then your proposal of changing diet would change the index, I, I think. Okay, then this I understood. Okay, well, okay, great. And yeah, uh, and also did you try to do the simulations like with the different, like with nitrogen and the other uh, caloric or other measures and if it changed a lot? And thanks for the presentation. Hi, I'm Lou from France. Um, as you showed in your slides, there is a huge concentration of power in the agricultural system in La Réunion, but also elsewhere. Um, and you have big lobbies for conventional agriculture, especially synthetic fertilizer that work together with the fossil fuel industry. Um, and I wanted to know how much is the food sovereignty movement affected by this kind of like lobbies for conventional agriculture and synthetic fertilizer in La Réunion, but also elsewhere in Europe, Brazil, and all of these countries, if you have experience on it. Um, because I, I was a civil society uh, observer at the UN, and I was following agricultural negotiation, and I was lobbying for the reduction of synthetic fertilizer. It was very hard because a lot of especially Brazil, India, and a lot of South America, has this rhetoric of we can pr like provide food for the world without synthetic fertilizer, which is not always scientifically true. Um, but because they have like lobbies behind them pushing for it. Um, so I wanted to kind of get your opinion on these lobbies and how much are they affecting or even threatening this kind of food sovereignty movements. Uh, Sylvain from France. Um, I was wondering about how to uh, to change this uh, agro-food system uh, because I know that there are a lot of people who are trying to change this and you propose something that is, uh, I think, understandable uh, and uh, it's like um, something that helps understanding that uh, a change is feasible and uh, so my question is that uh, you've been working on this topic for years I think and uh, how what is the resistance toward change in uh, Europe because uh, we see that we have a politic in Europe which is called a PAC uh, agriculture uh, politics, uh, it's a 
decided every seven years, but uh, we see that that it doesn't change. And uh, I think that is really abnormal because uh, we have all the scientific evidence that our food system is not good. It is depend on uh, external uh, uh, fertilizer, but also uh, that is uh, uh, causing, um, because yes, there is also soy that you didn't mention, but uh, to feed our animals there. So it's, it's a whole system that needs to be changed on a global level. And I want to, to know uh, at a political level how, how we can change this, if possible. <laughs> Okay, just uh, a discussion about uh, why nitrogenism metrics rather than calories or uh, euros or dollars or or what thing else. Well, just um, no, you you could do it with calories. Okay, f first thing, um, when you meet the diet in terms of proteins, you certainly these proteins are not. Uh, s pure proteins in your in your food. It's mixed with uh, uh, grease and uh, sugar and things like that. So, in fact, uh, once you have your required amount of protein, you are sure you have your required amount of calories. Except for special uh, activities, huh? uh, a bicycle runner, for instance, uh, eats continuously uh, calories in under the form of sugar <laughs> and uh, in addition to, to his proteins uh, he, he drinking uh, sugar uh, solutions and things like that or or milk or things like that but on, in milk there is a lot of protein but okay so so you, you can get your energy with your protein but once you get your protein ration you are sure you have far enough grease and sugar as needed. So I it's correct to do that. Uh, well, so making the analysis with another uh, metric would probably bring to the same conclusion. It's just less easy to make the link with the fertilizers, uh, the yields of uh, of uh, agricultural fields and, and so on. So nitrogen is a very suitable tool for doing that. It makes mm -hmm. things clearer, but it's not usually necessary. I'm the only one doing that. <laughs> well, not the only, but I I it's a school. Uh, there are other schools making uh, things in terms of tons, but that's very complicated. But how, how to compare tons of cherries and tons of wheat and tons of milk, and just, uh, that's not comparable. So so that's difficult. But that can be done. Okay. Um, well, so that, that's it. So y y both of you are in some your question were related, uh, uh, the, the, the role of lobbies. Uh, I have no answer to that, except that we can indeed uh, see that um, the policies today are very much influenced by the interest uh, of uh, big lobbies, by big companies uh, looking for their profits. And that's, that's how we get there. But you could, find you, you asked a question about th this question of agro-food systems. But you could ask exactly the same about the policies related to climate. Uh, you have the same paradox of the scientific community uh, putting in, in front of the discussion the, the urgency to change the energetic system and the total inaction of uh, governments and the in fact, the, the influence of big lobbies having interest either uh, on continuing uh, exploiting uh, fossil fuels or substituting them by uh, other forms of energy, uh, like uh, I am thinking of nuclear uh, electricity, uh, which pose other but similar problems. So, uh, this, this, okay, I have no answer about that. Yes, that's a pity. <laughs>
um, I'm Kushi. I'm from India, and my question was related to let's say we're talking about plant-based protein. So I wanted to ask that how can we actually make sure that the plant-based protein is actually available or like accessible to all? So when I talk about let's say the context of uh, my country, so we have like about 73% of the Indians who are like deficient in protein. And on top of that, we have highest rates of malnourishment in the world. So, and on top of that, you have the caste system, which prevents you from, let's say, eating or like even suggesting that you should give like eggs to children. So in a condition like that, where massively people are malnourished and also incredibly poor. So how do we ensure that we can have like vegetable protein and at the same time also ensure that it is like accessible to all and it's not being imposed in a purity culture caste system kind of way. Thank you. I'm Dimitila from Italy and I was wondering uh, why uh, a study of 100% um, plant-based uh, scenario has not been included in your study about La Reunion. And also, uh, my other question is related to Sulfia's one. Um, what are the best parameter to assess the, let's say, the smallest case, scale as possible for um, food sovereignty? Which parameters are the best to assess the small scale as, as possible for uh, studying food sovereignty and food self-sufficiency? Yeah. And like, do you include only um, biophysical and chemistry parameters, or also uh, economic variables or other indicators? Hi, thank you very much. I'm Haley from the US. Um, my question is also a bit more on kind of uh, the supply across different places and to Zulfia's point on there are places that are going to need to rely on imports. If we're talking about a hypothetical where we do away with fertilizer-based uh, food production, is it possible through more um, organic methods to produce the surplus that would be needed to import to those places or is there yeah like is there another kind of safer fertilizer alternative or something or those organic methods you know do at least or could provide the amount of food needed uh, to cover those those gaps that's my question okay um well uh, i'm sorry i, I cannot easily answer your, your very good question. Um, I have no answer to, to, to that. I, I think you, you raise a very important issue, but uh, I cannot answer. I simply cannot answer. I'm sorry. <laughs> Regarding your question, well, my, my answer will be very short, in fact. Uh, no, I didn't consider other parameters than those uh, related to the biogeochemical functioning of the system. That, that's my field. Uh, ma making uh, an economic analysis of that uh, requires to use another metric, of course, that I don't, well, uh, an economic metric, which is money. But you see the, the big difference between <laughs> making uh, a biogeochemical analysis and an economic analysis is that uh, when dealing with nitrogen or calories or phosphorus or, or, or even tons, uh, you have a conservative indicator. You can use the idea that all which enters the system goes out or remains in the system, uh, but you have conservation of that. Uh, I am very uh, uncomfortable when <laughs> dealing with uh, euros or, or dollars because they don't obey this conservation rule. And so that's much more difficult for me. <laughs> that's that's your, your specialty. But uh, I, I think 
this indicator, these economic indicators, uh, mixed the representation of the mass balance between things and the power uh, of the agent uh, acting for the circulation of the, the, uh, the material. And so distinguishing between what indicates a, a flux of material from a flux of influence and of power and uh, leadership is very difficult when, when you are dealing with dollars. And I cannot do that, <laughs> simply. <laughs> but uh, it's pro probably it's more, it would be very m much informative about the responsibilities, about the, the action of lobbies, ab uh, about the, uh, the, the, the master of the rules. But this is not what biogeochemistry can show, simply. Uh, and then your question about, yeah, w w your question was, can organic farming uh, provide enough fertilizing resources to, to feed the world? To the What? I mean, is there, I mean, obviously there are other alternatives like just less fertilizers or maybe safer fertilizers as well, but I don't know, like, yeah, yeah. is there a possibility to fit well, that? Well, all the scenarios I made for Europe, uh, those we made at a broader scale for, for the world, uh, I mentioned that, uh, we're considering fully organic mm -hmm. agriculture. So, so we exclude all use of chemical synthetic fertilizers. Uh, just for clarity. Well, of course, less is better than more <laughs> uh, use of uh, chemical fertilizer. But once, once you decide, well, you, you know, organic, uh, organic agriculture is not simply conventional farming without fertilizer, without synthetic fertilizer. It's a completely different way of conceiving the crop rotation and so on. So you cannot say, I just cut by half the uh, amount of uh, synthetic fertilizer and see what happens. No, that's, that's not how it works. It, it, it either you use synthetic fertilizer or you don't. If you don't, you have to transform completely the crop rotations. And that's another type of agriculture. And this, these are these other types of agriculture that, that, that we are testing. So all the conclusion I, I gave for Europe, for for the Réunion and for uh, the world is without any synthetic fertilizer. Okay. But then that's just for like regional self-sufficiency, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, where does the, the food production come for the places that aren't going to be producing? Yeah, yeah. Anyway. Yes, you're right. Hi, thank you. Um, I'm curious, what transformations to the treatment of human waste are implied by um, these like necessary changes to the nitro nitrogen cycle and nitrogen flows? Um, yeah, that's the whole question. Oh, uh, Dominic, I'm from Canada. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, thank you, uh, I'm Jan from Germany. Uh, I have a question about the um, the optimal uh, or like ecological uh, diet that was uh, also like proposed in like this the study. Um, so animal proteins uh, were um, severely reduced compared to the current diet, but they were still a part of of the the diet. And I was wondering if this is because of some um, uh, biophysical uh, um, re reason, because from a let's say vegan standpoint you could argue maybe the optimal uh, amount of vegan of, of animal proteins is zero uh, or is it still included in the study f uh, for more cultural reasons that a lot of uh, cuisines around the world have a lot of uh, animal proteins so this would be my question uh, hi i'm thomas from norway i also have a question about fertilizer and i just 
I didn't quite understand how it was possible if if nitrogen is lost in every step of the process, how is it possible to continue the uh, producing uh, food without extra uh, fertilizer from the outside? Yeah. Uh, uh, yes, re remember your question? What, what's human a waste. Sorry? Human waste. Human, oh yes, human waste. Oh, yeah. that, that's uh, very important. I, I, in, in fact, it's related to, to, to the last question also. Uh, you know, uh, I, I mentioned that fertilization can be, can, can keep, can, can be from two origins. Either recycling of the, the con of the waste of the res of the consumption of the harvest and these are animal wastes but these are also human wastes mm -hmm. and so when i spoke of uh, reconnecting crop production and animal uh, breeding li livestock breeding uh, this was the reason uh, the, the reason was closing this cycle but uh, i could have said exactly the same for human consumption and indeed uh, well, animals eat more than than humans and produce more manure than than humans but uh, both these types of manure are recyclable and can be a part of the fertilization the other part of the fertilization, which compensates for the losses, is uh, either synthetic fertilizer or symbiotic fixation, because this is uh, new fertilization coming not from recycling but from uh, fixation from the atmospheric pool. But you are completely right to underline the fact that human waste have also should also be recycled and in fact in, in the scenario there i considered uh 70 percent of recycling of the human wastes as for animal wastes in fact but that's part of the clue of the closing the gap the, the cycle of course uh, so the uh ah yes vegan or not <laughs> vegan. <laughs> uh, well, yes, indeed. Um, well, you, you brought the argument. You, you can be vegan for philosophical reason, and I respect that. And uh, okay, we, for the same reason that we are not uh, eating uh, human beings, <laughs> you, you can consider that it's. Uh, it's impossible to eat animals. I can understand that and I respect that. Uh, however, as a biogeochemist, uh, when I am confronted with the problem of resources, I see that eating animals is completely crazy <laughs> uh, from a biogeochemical perspective. If these animals are eating the same vegetal food that you are eating, because they, they waste a lot of, of that, and the resources provided by these animals may be qu qualitatively useful. Milk, cheese uh, is excellent, meat is maybe excellent, but it is wasting the resources that could be consumed and cooked uh, very tastily <laughs> uh, di directly. Uh, so when, when these animals are eating the same feed as uh, the same food as w as humans it's uh, it's not interesting uh, when these animals are eating grass for instance that we cannot assimilate and that's a case of ruminants uh, it makes sense to grow these animals on this resource and to to take benefit of the products they can offer to us milk eggs uh, meat skins, <laughs> uh, wool, and so on. So, uh, but, okay, but that's just a biogeochemical perspective. And uh, in, in our scenario, the share of animal protein consumption that we live all 
is, is exactly calibrated on the resources, the feed resources available in, in each territory for feeding animals without competition for human food. That is uh, grass and uh, wastes of uh, transformation, thing like that. Is that okay for you? Yeah, are you vegan? Um, not strict yet. <laughs> I, I think I did. So we have two very final questions. <laughs> Hi, my name is Matt from Australia. You partially answered the question just then, but I wanted to kind of reiterate because um, you were working with an NGO. I wasn't exactly sure what the relationship was between you and the NGO you talked about. And I think someone was a, a co-author in the paper as well. Um, what was the conversation with them like about making the decisions about, you know, for example, the reduction in plant-based, oh, sorry, in animal-based um, consumption of protein? And was there a kind of discussion about how to make this culturally appropriate? Or, you know, because obviously they're, they're pursuing food sovereignty as a goal in and of themselves. So how, how, how was that conversation working with them? And was your approach with the self-sufficiency and you kind of had your... Gra graphs, graphs model, or grams model. Anyway, so was that kind of an easy fit into what they were already doing? And yeah, I'm curious. Uh, hi, I'm Andresa from Brazil. Thank you for the presentation. It was very interesting. Um, I would like to understand more what are the impacts of uh, fertilizers for the environment apart from the emissions uh, because there are uh, advancements in technology to increase the efficiency of uh, uh, fertilizers and also to reduce uh, the emissions. Um, so what do you think about this? What are uh, the broad uh, environmental impacts of the synthet synthetic fertilizers? And also, I would like to uh, understand more if the organic production would imply in, for instance, uh, increasing the land use, use because uh, it can be m less efficient uh, than the current uh, production. So uh, what would be also the uh, environmental impacts of organic production for um, substitute, uh, replace the current uh, uh, way of production? Hello, my name is Aaron from Mexico. Um, I have a question regarding farmers. I don't know if I missed that in the presentation, but you talked a little bit about how the legal and financial ownership was really concentrated among a couple of uh, enterprises. Um, I was wondering how in this discussion around food security and self-sufficiency, self um, how do you envision the role of farmers in different contexts or how I don't know if you got the opportunity to see the situation in uh, the island and what their stance is regarding their situation. But um, yeah, if you have any insight on that. <coughs> uh, th these two questions are in some way related to what is the role of, uh, of uh, the role the, and the vision of the Brionese people, either farmers or members of uh, of uh, NGOs. Uh, and okay, F as I said, uh, I'm not. I have not been living for long in Réunion Island, so I, I cannot, I cannot answer really the, this question. Uh, What I perceived about the, the, the about the position of I will begin with your question the, uh, about the the, the standpoint of uh, farmers. Well, this is they are they are the planters, the cane planters, which depends very strongly on this system 
uh, which have in fact not a lot of choice in the, they, are, they are growing their kin field uh, they are selling uh, their their cane, uh, the sugar cane, uh, to the plant, and that's all. And the, the price is negotiated for the whole of Highland every year. Uh, and okay, they receive the it's permanent. They, they have the instruction for for cultivating in a certain way. They have no choice of selling their their products to one or, or another buyer okay so they are very much locked in a system and they are they mostly revendicate a higher price for their crop <coughs> then you have in fact the rather uh, a rather higher number of small very small market gardeners <coughs> and those are much more diversified in their production. They can develop local markets or sell to for, for exports, but they have much more liberty for, for their strategy. And many of them, most of them in fact, uh, transit to organic farming and try to develop those kind of uh, filières uh, of, uh, of products. And there are much more uh, attentive to, to this kind of prof use of self-sufficiency and local markets and so on. So probably the, the most, if, if you have to, to, dis to, to designate one social category of people which can be acting for self-sufficiency or, or at least transformation of the food, the, the agro-food system in Reunion Island, it is by these uh, small uh, market gardeners that you will find uh, the most active people. Regarding my contacts with uh, the NGO, with, uh, Reunion, uh, with Oasis Reunion, well, as I said, I was asked by them, so in some way this study is a command <laughs> uh, or at least a query by, by these people which are very, well, these became friends for many of them. <laughs> uh, but okay, that, that's all. I am not a member of this organization because I am not living there. Uh, I have good contact with them. Uh, they were glad to receive this as a, in a way, as a scientific caution, uh, caution is that an English word? Uh, no, yes, okay. <laughs> as a caution for for uh, for what they they revendicate. So, okay, um, but I am not an activist uh, because I am just not living there. I cannot act, be active there. Uh, the contacts were very, very good, and I, I think uh, it is a good example of cooperation between scientific uh, uh, environment and, and uh, NGO. Is was that for your question, or more or less for for the less side, <laughs> for the less side, for the less side. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, did I answer everything? Uh, oh, sorry. Your question was about, about the ah yes, the environment effect of uh, fertilizers, uh, or no, the environmental effects of substituting uh, fertilizer by organic farming. That's that was your question, huh? Well. Uh, <coughs> Two things. Uh, first, one aspect of the deleterious effects of conventional farming on soil and environment in general is the intensity of fertilization. Uh, I, I showed the wh when you increase fertilization, you increase the yield, but you 
also increase very rapidly the losses. And that is true as well for synthetic fertilizer or for organic fertilizer. If you bring a high amount of, fertil of nitrogen as either synthetic fertilizer or symbiotic fixation or manure, uh, the, the effect is the same. You will lose a larger part of what you have brought if you brought a lot than if you brought a little. Okay? And so uh, the problem there is intensification more than the kind of uh, fertilizer you use. That's for one part of the question, uh, of the answer. The, the other aspect of the question is that in conventional agriculture, you not only use uh, synthetic fertilizer, but you, because you use that, you simplify the rotation and you have often uh, co-occurrence uh, year after year of the same crop, that, that is monoculture, and that requires also pesticides. Uh, because uh, you, you cannot make a monoculture without pesticides. And so, when you replace synthetic fertilizer by organic farming, you not only substitute the kind of fertilizer you use, but you also change completely the structure of agriculture. You, you use longer rotations with more diversity, and then you can get rid of the use of pesticides. And, and that's, okay, organic farming uh, excludes not only synthetic fertilizer, but also synthetic pesticides. And so for that reason, organic farming is always better than uh, conventional farming, even at the same level of intensification. And the more so if the uh, level of intensification is lower which is often the case. Okay? Great, so thank you very much, Dr. Bilen, for this very, very interesting presentation and for the fascinating discussions. Let's give him a warm applause. Thank you.